Yes, we can just put on some intermission worship music. So, um, give me a second. Oh, yeah. Thank you. Also, Daughters of Zion, um, on February 23rd, which is a Friday night, um, we also have Kingdom Women Finances. This is an opportunity to discuss finances, budgeting, as we prepare for tax season. So you are all invited. Just wanted to, just wanted to um, give you a heads up on that. If we can just greet one another in the love of Christ, <laughs> amen, as we prepare. Yes, my God, we worship you. Amen. <laughs> Amen. Okay, I'd like to ask you all if you can please stand. Praise God. As we prepare to be fed, how many of us are grateful for our spiritual parents? Amen. Uh, amen. So right now, I, thank you. <laughs> amen. Hi. <laughs> God bless you. <laughs> Praise the Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Another Thursday night. Another time where we can learn more about everything. We are a learning church. We yes. learn. We desire to learn. We desire to know more. We want to be effective when we're speaking to people, not just those who have been churched, but also those who have not been churched. Yeah, let's work on that microphone. I don't want to go up and down today. I want to make sure that we are steady. Here's the thing about what we do. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Jesus. That's what we do. <laughs> Thursdays, Saturdays, we get it right. It's practice, right? Because yeah. one day, we're not going to have the opportunity to do it like this. The place is going to be so big. Yeah. 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 We're not going to be able to come to the front and race to the front. And, no, that's not going to happen. But I, I ask today that we keep it, I don't care if it's a, a low volume, we leave it at that volume, do not touch it, let's keep it just like that. My voice is loud enough. You know, Jesus passed on the Jesus thing, right? To be able to speak loud and multitudes hear. So we can do that. Praise the Lord. Praise How many love Jesus here today? learning more about those other uh, thought processes, paradigms, that seem to try to convince people, try to remove the deity and the accountability that we have. We are accountable to a God, a God who is supreme over all. He's the one true God, the only God. And our job is to be able to live according to his will. And if we do, we are part of his plan. And if we're part of his plan, everything falls in place. Yeah. Everything. And then that's when you can say, it's not because of how good I am, but rather because of how good he is. Yeah. How much I've allowed him into my life to do what he wants to do with me. Yeah. I'm an instrument of the living God. Oh, that's great. And even though I'm rusty, even though I'm used a lot, I'm okay because he's using me more than the shiny one that's hanging there looking good. Uh, as long as I am that instrument being used, 
the rust just means that I am being used a lot more. And I'm okay with that. Oh, but you look dirty. That's okay. I'm a used tool of God. Amen. When he goes into the shed, when he goes into the shed, he, he looks for me. You got to say that too. When he goes into the shed, he looks for me. Ooh, glory. When he goes into the shed, he looks for me. That's right. I'm going to say me. You're going to say me. Right? Me. He goes in. He says, right now, I need one of those star, those, those uh, Phillips. Yeah. Okay. Let's, see, let's see which one I use. The one that, that's, that's real shiny or the one that's real used up? Amen. Praise God. So, we're going to continue off where we left off, uh, continue on where we left off last week. Um, and a lot of what we're going to talk about, I'm going to also touch on the Trinity of God. But last week we left off on the evolutionist view. Please be seated. Praise God. Thank you, Lord. We bless you, Father. We give you glory today. Let everybody here in this house receive. Let each one of them represent, let each one of us represent hundreds. Amen. That what you filter through us, my God, will be for others. That what we receive, my God, will be for those around us. And if we may, Lord, let it be that if, even if we seemingly think we are not remembering things, that that moment of conversation would draw it up. What you get today, you already know. I'm just bringing it up. You already know. Why? Because God already thought about it. And he thought about you. And every teaching is already in eternity. And the eternal God is able to give you everything from heaven. Even the things you don't you think you don't know, you already know. That's, that's a little too deep, but let me just sit down for a minute. Um, praise God. Praise God. Evolutionist view. Number three. I think we had, we the last one we did was the agnostic view, right? If I'm not mistaken. So number three is the evolutionist view. And the evolutionist view, we touched on evolution a little bit. Anti-supernatural approach to life. And its origin, it is anti-supernatural. The implications are serious. Here are the implications. If God created man, that man is a morally responsible being. If God created man, then man is a morally responsible being. If evolution, then man is only biologically and not morally responsible to any God. Man is just biological. If you're only biological, then it makes sense to not do anything. Don't even come to church. Just eat. Sleep, work, till you die. When you're morally responsible, it makes it, it gives you a picture of what's coming next. That means everything we're doing now is for a future event. Everything that goes on in our life now is for a future event. Two weeks ago, I explained to you how the five senses are literally... A spiritual thing and not a physical thing is that the physical was created for it. So this is what I said. Let's see if you guys remember. I said in order for you to understand the spiritual things, you cannot negate the five senses. The five senses are not earthly. They're spiritual. Prove it. When you dream, you smell without using your nose. When you, when you dream, you see without using your physical eyes. When you dream, you hear without using your physical ears. There is a, a spiritual side. Now, some people would say, well, that's just the mind recording things. Do you know that from inception, conception, or being within the womb, the child is already reacting to these things without memory of anything beforehand? Or should I say without memory of anything physically beforehand? 
Because there's something that's already there. In heaven, you see. In heaven, you hear. Isaiah chapter 6 is what I used before. You hear, you see, you taste, you touch. In heaven, all those things are actively moving. And they take place. That means that you can participate in the five senses without having a corporal body. Without being physical. And if that's the case, then there is a God. And, and evolution in, its, in the way it's presented is not an accurate belief or an accurate uh, theory. Theoretically. I mean, it is a theory because theory is not conclusive. So it is a theory, but it's a, it's a, it's a theory with holes. So it will remain a theory. Amen? Amen? So evolutionist view is a view that, that, you know, of course, made popular by Darwin. Darwinism. But Darwin wasn't the one who first thought about it. There were many minds that thought about that before. Just that there's always one to vocalize. There's always one to step to the scene and say, I want to make this public. I want to make sure that people know this. So Darwin took on that approach. And the sad part about Darwin is, well, the good part about Darwin is that after his thorough, people don't talk about this, after going deep in and looking at things and looking at strands that are not connected, uh, what they call the missing link. Anybody ever heard of that? Yeah. The missing link, there's something missing. He came to the conclusion that there must be a God. He died believing God. Amen. After all those years of arguments, because it happens like that. Some of us could be wrong all our life, but that last minute counts. Amen. On the cross, there was a man who had it wrong all his life. But in the last minute, all he said was, remember me. And he got it right that last minute, that last moment, he got it right. Everything he did beforehand was pushed aside. There's a moment right now that could be your moment of got it right. But I don't say this so that you can look at this and say, well, are you anti? I'm, I, can, I can be anti these things, but I need you to get to your conclusion. This is why we teach this. And I give you the short version only because of the space of time we have does not allow us to really go deep in. But it allows you to say, well, let me look further into this. I want to tease you to get to a place where you say, I want to find out more about this. What does the Bible say about evolution? What does the Bible say about reincarnation? That's another view. The reincarnation view is that you come back as another creature. If that's the case, then we have a problem. Some of us, based on behavior, come back as a roach. <laughs> But then here's the problem. Then you stop after you're human. Because only in your humanity are you able to be morally inclined. You didn't catch that. I thought you would get it. Right? Only human, only a human can be morally inclined. Dogs, cats, no, no other animal is morally inclined. So if you get to a place where you're human and now you didn't get it right, now you are a, a frog. That means you stay a frog or there, there's no moral standard. You just do. You just eat flies. You know, you go from tadpole to frog. So, so you don't, there is nothing to gauge your moral standard. The only level of moral standard being gauged is as a human being. So that eliminates, kills completely this whole reincarnation thing. Because the true essence of the, the reincarnation concept is that behavior determines your next animal life or your next life, whatever you're going to be, right? Makes no sense. Number four, polytheism. Very popular for thousands of years and still popular today, just in different forms. Back in the days you had Greek mythology and you had Roman mythology. And I kind of want to touch on this a little bit and to show you how this can 
alter and even, even allow the church to see things in, a, in an awkward way. Paul was confronted by these different types of religions. Uh, when he went from church to church, a lot of the churches that he went to were churches that were, uh, they were not Jewish. You know, they were, they were churches that started off pagan, pagan churches. I mean, they, they started off believing in multiple gods. And so I want to share with you an area that I believe is, is very important. I think understanding this will allow you to understand the mindset. Polytheism is the belief in many gods. Um, of course, you got Romans, the Egyptians, the Greeks. They all come. They all have the same concept. As a matter of fact, the more gods you have, the more the wealthier you are. So they kind of determine your status based on how many gods are with you. So of course, you understand that when the Jews came out and said, you know, uh, we serve one God, the one true God. They're like, you broke. You only have one God? When the truth is, all you need is one God. <laughs> we see that in, in India, you know, Hinduism, uh, they have over a million gods. It's just, what is it, six million? It's a whole lot. Like everything is, oh, that's a God. The problem with that is that you again, remove that mor moral accountability. And that's the goal. The goal is to remove moral accountability. So let's look at this polytheism and let's see the effect of it in the word. Let's go to 1 Corinthians chapter 14. And I want to show you the little dilemma that Paul had. And this dilemma was a clear one because unfortunately, he had to do certain things with different places and how many know that sometimes humanly speaking we try to solve things on our own Amen. and even though God says one thing we try to solve it in other ways Amen. praise God so one of the things that I want to make sure that we look at when we're going into the word is picturing what Paul was going through when he was preaching or teaching to a certain group Look at one of the contradictions, and, and this is going to be one of the things that I want you to pay attention to, because with this, you will understand what did Paul have to go through. So we're going to go 14 first, then we're going to go to uh, 1 Corinthians 11, and then we're going to go to Romans chapter 16, and we're going to, I'm going to show you the great dilemma of Paul. So we'll go with 1 uh, Corinthians 14, and I'm going to say, let's go all the way to... Verse, let's start with verse 26, just to keep it in context. When you're there, please say amen. Amen. Well, my brothers and sisters, let's summarize. When you meet together, one will sing, another will teach, another will tell some special revelation. God has given one, has given one will speak in tongues, and another will interpret what is said. But everything that is done must strengthen all of you. No more than two or three should speak in tongues. They must speak one at a time and someone must interpret. By the way, this here, this here has been one of the dilemmas as well. And you see somebody speaking in tongues and somebody says, well, where's the interpreter? And they'll just discount you all together because there are different types of speaking in tongues. But that's not today's class. <laughs> I'm going to go right to the verse that I want to get to. That way we don't get caught up with everything else. Verse 34, it says, Women, women should be silent during the church meetings. Uh, somebody's talking, women, women, shh, shh. According to the word, if you speak, you are out of line, women. It's going to be fun. They should be submissive, just as the law says. If they have any questions, they should ask their husbands at home. For it is improper for women to speak in church meetings. That means everybody here, if you said one word during a church, if you said hallelujah, you are out of line. This is 
Paul's writing to the Corinthians. And, and the first question you got to ask yourself, well, then this is the word of God. So how is it that that's, I'm going to show you today. Today you leave here with a different perspective. And if you're religious, I'm about to kill that cow. <laughs> that cow cannot go on. I'm, I'm going to try. I will succeed. Amen. Amen. Now, after he said this, this is to the church of Corinth. I want you to take a look at, and by, by the way, the church of Corinth and this next church I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to read about. The letters were written around the same time. If anything, this letter was written first, even though Romans is first in the line of letters, 1 Corinthians was written first. That's important for you to know. So now let's go to Romans 16. Romans 16. I'm going to show you the dilemma of these polytheistic people that Paul had to deal with. And why you have to do this. 16.1. When you have it, please say amen. 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 Okay, wait for me. <laughs> <laughs> there we go. It says here, I commend to you our sister Phoebe. Sister. Phoebe. Meaning it's female. Because some people say, well, Phoebe could be a male. No. To our sister Phoebe. <laughs> who is a deacon in the church in Centurion. Welcome her in the Lord as one who is worthy of honor amongst God's people. Help her, the leader in that house, who's a deacon, help her in whatever she needs, for she has been helpful to many and especially to me. I can go on. No, there's a little bit more. I'm going to throw somebody else in there. Give my greetings to Priscilla. Priscilla is a female. And the killer, which by the way, the killer was not a female. The killer's a husband. Even though it ends with an ah. My co-workers in the ministry of Christ Jesus, meaning we work together. Priscilla, Achilla, and myself, we work together. These are my peers. My co-workers. Watch this. Why the church of Corinth was told, no teaching anyone, women stay silent, you teach and you ask your husbands at home. And why Rome, the Romans, that wasn't an issue. Why is he telling the Roman church, make sure you listen to this woman. Make sure you pray for her. Make sure that you allow her to understand her position as a leader amongst you. Anybody want to answer that question? Good, you're keeping it safe. Mm -hmm. Oh, you had your hand up over there? Go ahead. Give him the microphone. Let's see what he says. He said uh, the Corinthians, 1 Corinthians was written first. Yes. Then it, then it must have been revealed to them if um, Romans was written next. So... Almost, but no. But but you see, you're bold and you, t you gave it a shot. There's a strategy here. And if, if you understand my line of thought, then you got to connect it to polytheism. Over here, and then over here, and then over here. One, two, and three. Was it that in that area, uh, most women were leaders? Okay, so she knows the answer. Praise God. Did you want to continue on that line of thought? Right off of that. I was just going to say the same thing, that it must have been that culture. Say, they didn't hear you at home. I was going to say the same thing, that those rules applied to that specific church because it had to have been the culture. They were still all poly polytheistic. They all believed in many gods. So there's a reason why. I'm, I'm glad. Did you want to answer a little bit? Okay. There's a reason why. <laughs> he kind of put his hands up and gave the microphone. <laughs> There's a reason why, and, and I want you to understand that that's, this is the way we are told to rightly divide the word. You, can't, if, you can literally make your own religion by reading one thing in the Bible and then treat all women with contempt. 
And then when everybody argues with you, you say, no, 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 let me take you there. First Corinthians 14, look what it says. I'm going to give you one more. Let's go to First Corinthians 11. This is for real. Some real stuff. First Corinthians 11. Yeah, he has a question. Go ahead. Praise the Lord. Thank you, Jesus. I'm filling in the gaps. Thank you, Lord. Until it gets fixed. Thank you, Jesus. Amen. That's how we do. In the churches, that's how we do. Uh, uh, Dad, why did Paul say co-worker in uh, addressing Priscilla and Aquila uh, in such a manner where he said co-worker in the ministry of Jesus Christ? Like, what was he trying to uh, share with us that there was some type of position that he was alike with them in, in, in a way? Was that... Well, there, there, there are two reasons why. One, he was a co-worker in the secular realm with them. They were tent makers. So those were his partners in the tent making business. But I know where you're getting at. Because apostolically, he could have been saying, they are co-workers work side by side with me in what we do in ministry. He, in not so many words, was saying, you know, these are apostles with me. They roll with me. Good point. Now let's look at let's let's go deeper into the dilemma. Eleven. First Corinthians chapter eleven. And we'll start with verse. Huh? Let's might as well start with verse one. Verse two. I am so glad that you always keep me in your thoughts and that you are following the teachings I passed on to you. But there is one thing I want you to know. The head of every man is Christ. The head of a woman is man, and the head of Christ is God. A man dishonors his head if he covers his head while praying or prophesying. A man dishonors his head if he wears any type of head covering. Anybody with me so far? But a woman dishonors her head if she prays or prophesies without a covering on her head. For this is the same as shaving her head. Yes, if she refuses to wear a head covering, she should cut all, cut off all her hair. But since it is shameful for a woman to have her hair cut or her head shaved, she should wear a covering. So I'm going to address that first. If we base this on word for word, then a whole lot of people here should be wearing big hats. A lot of women, this is where that came from, by the way. You ever been to a church where everybody's wearing hats or they're wearing the covering? It comes from here because it sounds as if you are in sin if you're not wearing a covering. And you ever see people when they walk in, they take their hat off a place? The reason why is because they believe that if you're wearing the hat and you're praying, you are defiling yourself. You're not connecting with God. No, look, I mean, you're, we're reading it, right? So, so here's the thing: if we're reading it, then we got we better come up with something really solid to be able to change what we think. That's why I want you to be at the edge of your seat right now. I'm building a case. And building this case right now requires you to understand the opposite side. Because again, if you're religious, you right now will stand your ground. See, I told you, look what it says. It says that in the Word. And that would make this whole church off completely. We do the total opposite of the hair. You got people, people got short hair. You know, people got no hair. You know, people got wear, wear hats. We got people wearing hats right now. Does that mean the ones who are wearing hats are not connected with God? The men that are wearing hats, they're not connected? I mean, that's what it's saying here. And if you're going to go religious, then that's, what it's, that's what's going on here. So there must be a problem. Let's continue. Verse 7. A man should not wear anything on his head when worshiping, for man is, is made in God's image and reflects God's glory. A woman reflects man's glory. For the first man didn't come from a woman, but the first woman came from man. This is so, such a case against women. And I told you that Corinthians was written before Romans. 
So if Corinthians was written before Romans, then that means all of this that's being stated, either, either uh, Paul had a change of heart, maybe he consulted with the Holy Spirit before going to Rome, or there's something different going on here. So the first thing I want you to, to, to know is that every letter written, every letter written by Paul has a letter that corresponds to it. What we don't have is the letter that was written to Paul by the church of Corinth. So there was, it, okay, so let's compare it to this. It's like Facebook. The letters were like Facebook. And what we don't see is the, 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 the request or the, the first statement made. What we see is the response. So everything we're seeing here is the response to the church of Corinth because they were going through a problem. So Paul had to address every single one of these problems. Some, he got it, you know, divine, and others, he added a little bit more seasoning. Oh, really? Yes. It's the reason why I don't listen. This is the word of God. But I understand what God allowed to be written in here for me to see man and what he allowed to be written in here for me to see God. Amen. Amen. Oh, some of y'all got that. I got a couple of amens on this side. Let me say it. Let me face over here. There are things in here that were written for us to know God, and other things that were written for us to know man. Amen. So what 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 is going on here? I could keep on finding so many other areas, but I'm not because of time. But I'm going to share with you this. The hub, polytheistic hub, for many gods, especially for the goddess Diana, or as some would call her, Artemis, was in the church or around the church of Corinth. This is going to be important for you to know. The problem here was that the women that were converting to Christianity were already a religious authority amongst the community so when they converted they felt they had to have position in the church because they served in the temple of the goddess Artemis Diana and because they served in there as women they had all the factors that were involved they had to have, uh, the, you know, the, the head covered. All these things had to be done, right? To be there, you had to have your have head covered. And the men were trying to be like women to be an authority in the church. Because they felt that in order, just like, just like circumcision, many thought that be, in order to become a Christian, Jewish, they, they thought they had to get circumcised first then to become Christian. Paul had to deal with that whole ordeal with Timothy. Get circumcised first and then become Christian. No. So here's the deal. The complaint was this. And I can imagine this. Oh, it's, it's, we don't have it here, but I can imagine this was the letter. Paul, we have a problem. Many women are be becoming, they're converting and they're taking authority. They're taking charge in the church. We don't know what to do because the public that's around, they feel that they are of authority because they're coming from the temples. They're converting, but they're taking charge. What should we do, Paul? Paul says, okay, I got to go a little extreme here. I got to let them know in Corinth that women can't be in charge. So he goes hard. And he says, in order for there to be anyone instructed, I don't let women speak in the church, in the gatherings. He had to go hard because it was hard. Now, is it right that, that he did it that way? All I can tell you is that he had a problem that he needed to solve. And he felt compelled that this is the only way to make it happen. I got to go extreme with the church of Corinth. The church of Corinth is off. So what happens? The church of Rome didn't have this issue. We just read Romans 16, right? Everybody read it? 
Is Romans 16 contrary to 1 Corinthians 11 and 14? Completely different. Here he's telling, he's telling them, honor this woman. He's doing the opposite, telling them, make sure you listen to this woman. He's telling the church this. He's not saying this to women. He's saying the church, honor this deaconess, Phoebe. Because Rome didn't have that problem. Now, they were polytheistic. They believed in many gods. And of course, Paul had to deal with this as he went from place to place. And this is what he had to deal with. Describing God as one. There was a time where he actually explained that he was going through, he was looking at all the gods in the temple. And then he went to one of the gods and, he, and one of the names underneath it was to the God that we don't know. The unknown God. They, they literally acknowledge an unknown God just in case they miss someone. So what does he say? Bingo! That's the God I want to present to you. The God you don't know. The one you don't even have a statue for. And sure enough, once that was presented, they were able to listen because they said, okay, this is a God we can tap into because he used that for the moment. That's wisdom. Let's take it a step further. If that's the case, then now we got to talk about the oneness of God. Polytheism is the belief of many gods. Is God okay with being more than one God? Or, or how about this one? Is God, Father, Son, Holy Spirit, three gods? I'm asking you a question. It's, really, it's a real question. No. Y'all looking at me like I'm crazy. No. It's a real question. One. He's one. Yeah. Let's see where God says it. Let's go to Deuteronomy chapter 6. The oneness of God. Deuteronomy 6. I want somebody to read it for me. Let's go to 6 4. Then I want somebody else to look up Isaiah 43 10. We're going to go with those verses right now. Deuteronomy 6 4. And that. Amen. How adamant is God about his oneness? Let's, let's, hear, let's hear God speak, right? Listen, 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 O Israel. Listen, O Israel. The Lord is our God, the Lord alone. Good. And you must love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, and all your strength. And you must commit yourself, yourselves worthy, worthy wholeheartedly. wholeheartedly to those commands that I am giving you today. In other words... Hear, O Israel, the Lord God is one. God is not schizo. Amen. God is saying he's one is because he is one. But doesn't he have a son? All right. Let's go to Isaiah 43.10. Somebody read that for me. But you are my witness, O Israel says the Lord, you are my servant. You have been chosen to know me, believe in me, and understand that I alone am God. There is no other God. There never has been, and there never will be. Whoa, 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 wait. Oh, that's powerful. <laughs> say that last, say the whole thing again. The whole thing is just wonderful. <laughs> but you are my witness. You are my Israel, witnesses, O Israel, O church. Says the Lord. O humans. You are my servant. You have been chosen to know me, believe in me, and understand that I alone am God. I alone am God. But I'm going to continue because I want you to understand what I mean by that. Keep going. There is no other God. There's no other. There never has been. Never has been any other God. There never will be. Never will be in the future. I, yes. I, I yes, yes. I, I am the Lord. I, yes, I, if you don't understand, am God alone. And there is no other savior. And there's no other savior. Hold on a second. Did not Jesus say he was a savior? Let's go to, I like this other one. Let's go to Isaiah 44, I think it's 6. Let's go there. 
This is the oneness of God. Go. Somebody. Anybody. This is what the Lord said. You need a microphone. It's okay. We just want we want to participate with the people at home. This is what the Lord says. This is what the Lord says. Israel's king and redeemer. Mm -hmm. The Lord of heaven's armies. Right. I am the first and the last. I'm the first and the last. There is no other God. None like other. Me. Who is like me. Who's like me. Let him step forward and prove to you his Step power. up if you want. <laughs> Let him do as I have done since ancient times. Let's see you do what I can do. When I established a people and explained its future. Oh. Do not tremble. Do not be afraid. Did I not proclaim my purposes for you, Lord? Mm. You are my witnesses. Is there any other God? Oh, I mean, you got, you got a lot in there. He's making it clear. If we want to translate that to how we, how we speak today, he's saying, yo, listen up. There ain't nobody like me. There never will be anybody like me. I'm the first and last. I have always was and always will be. If there's anybody who's able to do what I do, let them step up to the plate and do what I do. Let them say what I say. Let them say what I say. <laughs> if you can say what I say and do what I do, then that makes you God. Let's go to Revelation chapter 2. Because polytheism is the belief in many authorities. And God is saying, no, consolidate. Consolidate all your bills. Ah, come on, folks. Consolidate all your bills. Make it one. One bill. I'm just, it's all about me. Just one. Somebody read that for me. Reve, Reve, no, Revelation 1.8 first. Revelation 1 8, what does it say? Man, amen. Amen. We got to be really fast on this only because of time. It's kind of like pass that mic fast. Then, I am the Alpha and the Omega. What he said? I am the Alpha and the Omega. Does that sound a little bit like, like, like Isaiah 44? I am the first and last, right? Yes, sir. I'm the Alpha and the Omega. Alpha and Omega means first and last, by the way. Okay, what else? What does the he say? Beginning says? and the end. I'm the beginning and the end. Just in case says you don't know Lord Greek. God. Says the Lord God. Says the Lord God. I am the one who is. Uh huh. Who, who always was. Uh huh. And who is still to come. Wow. Hold on. God is speaking, right? Amen. That shuts down anybody who tries to make more than one God. Is he is one. Then, then I know the next question is going to be, I have to explain the Trinity. We will. Give me a second. Go ahead. The Almighty One. The Almighty One. That's it. Now go to Revelation 2.8. Who's enjoying this right now? Yes, well, praise the Lord. <laughs> Revelation 2.8. Get there. Mm -hmm. Write this letter to the angel of the church of Smyrna. This is the message from the one who is the first and the last. Okay, does that sound like Revelation 1 8? All right, so far, right? Keep going. Who was dead but is now alive. Hold on. <laughs> Wait a second. Revelation 1 8 says, beginning and end, but speaks as Isaiah 44 and Isaiah 43. But all of a sudden, there's this little thing that just added in there. What does it say? Who was dead but is now alive. Who was dead. So now he's speaking like Isaiah 44, where Isaiah 44 says, whoever says this is God. Amen. Keep going. I know about your suffering and your poverty, but you are rich. I know the blasphemy of those opposing you. They say that they are that they are Jews, but they are not. Let's stop there because then we got to go into a whole other thing. Mm -hmm. Let's read the beginning again. I need you to catch what was being what's being said. The first one we read, who said that? Revelation one eight. Who said that one? Mm -hmm. Who said Jesus? You think Jesus said that first one? Revelation one eight. 
That was good. That was good. Good, good answer. Amen. It's not red. Oh, it's not red letters. Revelation 1 8 is not red letters. That's God the Father. Because the Father never died. Revelation 2 8 says. This is the message from the one who is the first and the last. Whoa. I'm going to repeat what my father said. First and the last, get. Who was dead but is now alive. Who was dead but is now alive. So there's a dilemma here. Because I just told you that there, there is no other God. This is him by himself. He's, he's God. So how do we include Jesus when Jesus is at the what? At the what hand of the who? At the right hand. But isn't it just one throne? Revelation chapter 4 shows John seeing one throne. He sees one throne, but yet Jesus is at the right hand. Ooh! What I'm telling you is simply this. There is only one God. Polytheism will try to confuse you and get you to think that when we say there's a trinity, that we're serving three gods. We're not serving three gods. You are a linear, I'm gonna repeat this, I want you to catch what I'm gonna say. You are a linear thinker. All you think is everything the word is saying is linear, so you try to find A, B, and C. You don't realize it's A, F, J, C, F, R. It's all over the place. And God can put it the way he wants to. What makes him God is that he can remain one God and be three. Amen. Amen. Or, or should I say three functions. Amen. Still keep his deity as one. But have three stages in dealing with humanity. Jesus was always and is always God. Even, in, even when he took on the form of man. The problem here is that we try linear thinking, says, but there are three people, Holy Spirit. He even talks about Holy Spirit, Father, Son, Holy Spirit. It's because there is a, a, a mystery in the concept of here, here, and here. And I, I've, I've done this before, but for the sake of those who have not seen this, come here for a minute. Just for the sake of those who have not seen this, because I know I've done this before. Are you a son? Yes. Are you a father? Yes. All right. Are you a husband? Yes. Amen. <laughs> Are you one? Yes. <laughs> You're one, but when you write a letter to your father, is your letter going to be different? When you write a letter to your children, is your letter going to be different? Yeah. When you write a letter to your wife, it's going to be different. Yeah. Every one of those letters are different, same person, different moments. That's the best way to explain it. It's deeper than that. But it helps you out to understand. He's one. But his function in different moments is different. He, he will not talk to his son the way he talks to his wife. He will not talk to his father the way he talks to his son or his wife. Everybody has a conversation that's distinct. And so when we talk about the triune God speaking plurally, you know, it's one of the greatest mysteries. Jesus, Jesus was so cool. I'm going to show you how cool Jesus was. He would throw this plurality out of nowhere, and if you don't catch it, you won't see he's talking plural. You ready for one? Stay here with me. Stay close to me, Dad. Just, just for now. Let's go to John chapter 3. Look at this plurality. All this out of polytheism. When you have it, please say amen. 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 <laughs> All right, now amen. Okay. 
Look what he says. Oh, praise the Lord. You ready for this? Let's see where it says. Here it is. Here it is. So let's go chapter 3, verse 10. And people that read this, they read it so fast, they go to John 3.16 immediately. They just forget about everything else. For God so loved the world. <laughs> but look what he said before he says that. Now, now you're going to start reading the Bible differently. Look what it says. Jesus replied, you are a respected Jewish teacher, and yet you don't understand these things. I assure you, we tell you what we know and have seen. And yet you won't believe our testimony. But if you don't believe me when I tell you about earthly things, how can you possibly believe if I tell you about heavenly things? Did anybody catch something? <laughs> Jesus was talking to him. And he went plural on him. He went plural on him. He starts talking we. Look what he says. He says... I assure you, we tell you what we know and have seen, and yet you won't believe our testimony. And then the very next verse he goes, but if you don't believe me, singular, when I tell you about earthly things, how can you possibly believe if I tell you about heavenly things? Because the heavenly things require you to understand plural. The plurality of God. There are other moments where God spoke and met us. You want to say something to that? You want some microphone? <laughs> yeah, because I can argue that. Like, you, Hit me off. Hold up. Like, you, you're a bunch of 12 disciples. You talk about we. We mm -hmm. meaning you and your disciples are going to tell me about heavenly stuff. Tell me how, you're, 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 how Jesus is saying that he is God himself, but also God himself, meaning <laughs> Jesus, and God's spirit. I, you're not really telling me the whole pro thing with God. Uh, that's not bad. This is good. So this is when I get the shotgun I'm sorry. underneath the pulpit. And look what the shotgun does. This conversation was between two people at night and nobody else was there. Oh. <laughs> Hold on. And, and, and I can argue that as well. Because in the midst of him, you know, him mentioning him and Nicodemus doesn't state that the disciples weren't around them. He's just focusing on a conversation. If I say I spoke to dad in the room, dad, I'm, I'm only bringing a focal point to me and, and his conversation but that could have mean that many others were listening. Now, are you, are you certain of this before we, we go on? That uh, Did you read this to know that? I'm basing it on you telling me you're trying to... No, 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 no. Let me, let me repeat that. Okay, okay, okay. If I read it, okay. if I read it, and, and, and I, I'm just giving you time to, to save yourself. Got it, got it. So if you read this, then you know, not based on what you think is the case, in here, it is clear that Nicodemus didn't want anyone to know. Right. That he was talking to the master. So, well, well, easy, Nick at night. Hold on. Nick at night. So, so, no, this is good because you know what? Somebody's going to do this. I'm a, I'm a believer. I believe this. I'm just giving you guys just a perception of. Like, hey, how about I didn't read the Bible? I don't want, I don't, I don't. So then you can't have this discussion if you don't read the Bible. All right. Well, based on, if I, listen, they don't, they don't hear me at home. <laughs> Talk loud. So I'm basing it on a point. If I'm here sitting down for the very first time. Right. Right. I'm asking a question that, okay. That I'm, a first time would not ask. Right, right. Well, well, it depends who you are. Second time. You might not even question. No, no, no. I'm just saying, okay, listen. The whole point is, I'm I'm, listen, I'm seeing the scripture for the very first time. Right. And he's presenting the case of being a triune God. Right. Right. There's many aspects of questions that I can't ask right now. Right. So I'm asking based on me not reading the scripture. Mm -hmm. Following me. Right. So yeah, yeah. so I'm saying you can, you can tell me that you, it's uh, that did I read that? But no, I haven't read. It. Correct. So, so tell me in a manner because I know the scripture where he says I come to judge the world. 
I was sent to judge the world. That's the scripture I kind of wanted you to emphasize. John right? chapter 5. Where he's emphasizing his authority as both father and son. son. But we're basing it on just mere words of verbiage. Right. People will combat that. They will. We and I, so what? Yeah. We're, we're, mm -hmm. we're, so, 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 so here's a difference between, okay, here's okay, a okay. difference, this is good. Here's a difference between Sorry. a teaching of this caliber. No, leave me in. I want to close <laughs> oh, he, he's, he's in for it. <laughs> this, is, this is the difference between a teaching to individuals who have some capacity to observe, absorb, absorb the word, versus someone who is brand new who wouldn't take your stance publicly. Or if they come with this stance, then all I would have to do is read to them what's here. If they believe in the word, then they're going to go with what the word is saying. Because the first thing is, if you don't believe in the word, then I can't go back and forth with you anyway. First thing is, do you believe the word? For us to even have a discussion. So once you get to a place where you believe the word, then now we got we to talk about this. Because the plurality that was spoken here was on purpose. Jesus knew that Nicodemus wasn't going to catch it. Because it's, it's not revealed to him yet. That's why Jesus told him to be born again. And you got to be born again, right? What did, what, did, what did Nicodemus say? What do you mean? You got to go back in, linear thinking. Go back in and be born again. What, what, what is that? Well, you didn't understand the we, so you're not going to understand the born again either. Wow. Praise God. Tell me that, how good that, that was. That was good. Oh, no, no. Wow. You got the, the snack. Wow. Why, why did you leave? <laughs> it's okay. So, Amen. I thought it was my cue. No, that was good. That was good. No. Keep going. No, I just wanted to say it was good that you said that first time and we will not approach you like that. No. Because he's coming with a Nicodemus state of mind. Correct. That's good. That's, good. That's correct. And, and the, the validity of that is if, it, if a first time it comes to you at that, then they may be wanting to be more combative than to want to learn. And and there's there's there and, and I know that's what he was trying to portray, someone who would come combatively. But if you're coming to learn, then you will understand this this element of the we to I. How many understood this? Raise show your show of hands. Praise God. Okay, good, 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 good. Question. Microphone. Amen. This is good stuff, Dad. Amen. Glory to so. God. This reminded me of Genesis 1, 22. Yeah, we, then we God were says. <laughs> that, amen. We were headed right there. Amen. No, no, that's good. Read it. We're going to read it regardless. No, see, if someone wanted to argue the validity of being many people in one, you can go all the way back to the beginning. Genesis right. 1, 24. It says, let the earth produce. Okay, no, no. Okay, he says. Genesis 1, 26. 26, yeah. He says, let us make human beings in our image. We, to be like us, they will reign over everything, blah, blah, blah. And it basically, it goes over and over again that let's, let us, us, so if it's in the beginning of one God speaking who about. Who is he consulting with? Who is us? So, again, the plurality of God being shown in function as consulting with himself. Here's the reason why, folks. The unity of God demonstrates that agreement is required for things to happen. Wow. So God had to show that he agreed with himself right. to show the power of agreement. Three times. Three times. <laughs> three times over. Watch this. This is one let us. There's another let us. Right. Go to Genesis chapter 3. Yep. Genesis 3. And let's go to verse 22. Good number. Somebody. Anybody. Then, then the Lord God said, Look, the human beings have become like us. Woo! Huh? Knowing both good and evil. What if they reach out, take fruit from 
the tree of life and eat it, then they will live forever. So hold on. So God again speaks plural when he kicks out the humans from the Garden of Eden. Right. right. All right. That's number two. Let's go to number three. Genesis 11. Genesis 11. And we're going to go with, let's start with verse 5. But the, ready? I'm ready when you are. But the Lord came down to look at the city and the tower. The people, actually, actually, you know what? Read so it can be in context. Uh -huh. Let's read it from verse 3. Amen. They began saying to each other, let's make bricks and harden them with fire. In this region, bricks were used instead of stone and tear Tar. And tar was used instead of tar was used for water. Then they said, "Come, let's build a great city for ourselves with a tower that reaches into the sky. This will make us famous and keep us from being scattered all over the world." So majority here is saying, "Let us build." so that we can be more famous. They are coming in agreement with each other and there's power in agreement. When a church agrees with each other, the church is prosperous. The church is healthy. It is agreement that moves the earth. That's why God had to come in agreement. But look at this. The majority was in numbers and yet God is gonna do something that's gonna shut them down. Keep reading. But the Lord came down to look at the city. That's singular, right? The Lord? The Lord? Singular, okay. The city and the tower the people were building. Look, he said, the people are united and they, are, they all speak the same language. After this, nothing they set out to do will be impossible for them. Come, let's go down and confuse the people with different Wow. Who was he talking to? Come, let us go down. That's the King James Version. Let us go down. And let's confuse them. In other words, y'all thought you were the majority. We're going to be the majority. He had to come in agreement with himself. Let us, Father, Son, Holy Spirit, go down. Now, you notice something. These are three different moments. Right, 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 right. I'm going to show y'all something. Three different moments. And all three moments are represented by all three who speak. The first one was the father. And his function as father. Let us create them in our image. Speaking plurally to himself. The second one was the son. Because they ate of the tree that they were not supposed to eat from. And Jesus is the what? He's the tree. That's why he, and he's compared to the true vine. He's, he is that tree that we got to stay connected to. So then Jesus says, we can't have them eat from this. Let's kick them out. So the Father speaks let us, the Son speaks let us, and then the Holy Spirit, the great communicator, decides to speak up and say, let us. Because the last event with let us shows Holy Spirit removing language, speaking, and then he's the one who restores it later on. That's good. That's good. All right, so let's talk about the restoration of the let us. The restoration of the let us. The Father. The second one, the second let us, Jesus, he restores us so that we can now be connected to the Father. Third let us, Holy Spirit. Hmm. The speaking in tongues, or should I, people call it the upper room. 
experience was Holy Spirit restoring what was removed in the Tower of Babel in Genesis chapter 11. Jesus restored us into Eden and Holy Spirit restored us in communication. Good. Wow. Amen. That's good. Ah, come on somebody. Each one of them restored what they removed. Each one of them restored what they removed. Holy Spirit had to restore language amongst the body of Christ. That's discernment. That's word of knowledge. That's something we already have, but needs to be cultivated. Amen? For the sake of time, let me move any questions on what I just mentioned. I, I really threw in, that was a curveball right there. Yeah. I, I just got a question, uh, uh, some along the same line. Microphone. Oh, you should have a microphone right there. <laughs> okay, uh, my question was something similar to what uh, Pastor Eli was saying a little, a little while ago. Right. All right, uh, come, let us go down and confuse the people. What if someone says to you, oh, he was talking to the angels. So he was telling the angels, come on, let's go down there and take care of that. That's a good one. That's a good one. And here's the answer to that. If God got to consult with angels, we should be worshiping them too. Right. Amen. Wow. That's good. If it's the angels that have the authority to move in that manner, and there's a consulting with angels, then we should then have them as part of the deity. So that answers that question, and it's a very good question. Give me more. Any other questions? <laughs> All right, praise God. Number five, patheism. That was all out of polytheism, by the way, that whole teaching. Patheism means that everything is God, and God is in everything. Trees, rocks, animals, water, ETC. Now, that's a new age belief. You got people talking about that they get their energy from the universe. You don't even know the universe's name. What do you know about the universe? How can you explain that? I mean, show me your verses and chapters of that. Tell me what makes sense to you in that arena. How does that make sense? That the universe and God is in everything. He's in this wood. He's in that metal. Explain that. So that means that, again, that, that, would, that would actually lend to the belief that the altar has power. That would lend to the belief that there is power in material things. But we know that's not the case. We understand that God is not in items and trinkets. That God resides in a temple that, that he had to die for to be able to live in. Can y'all chew on that just a little bit? Just kind of chew on it. Look, Jesus died on the cross to make sure that he paid his rent in us. He paid it all to live in humanity, not in items and trinkets or animals and trees. All those things know, they know, they already understand what they need to do. Matter of fact, they, they know how to worship more than we do. Because they just, they just are. The sun worships. The sun and all its glory, the sun, the physical sun, knows how to worship God more than us. More than many of us, I should say. The sun ain't going to beat me. I'm going to wake up in the morning, I'm going to go, you know what, I'm going to give God glory more than you, son. Because the shine I have is his light. So I shine what he gives me to shine. Come on, somebody. Praise God. Last but not least, number six. Deism. Deism. D-E-I-S-M. No personal God. 
an impersonal God created the world and later divorced it. Giving God all of the areas of being, hmm, how can I put this? Being human, where relationship is based on time. So there is an area of divorce. Divorce happens because of time. Who's with me? It's understood that deism is one of those things that allows you, as, as a human, you can remove the Godhead or remove the deity of God to say that I don't have to acknowledge that there is a God because he no longer is around. They believe that there must have been a start. What they believe is that he's no longer listening. That he's no longer, he no longer exists, that he died. They only, they only acknowledge the transcendence of God. They deny his imminence. Praise God. Amen. That was number six. Anybody want to throw anything on that one? Because of time, I'm not going to get into I touched a little bit about the, the uh, Trinity of God, um, the misinterpretation of the Trinity. The term Trinity is not found in the Bible. It really isn't. Don't look for it. If anybody tells you, uh, no, Trinity doesn't exist because it's not in the Word, you tell them, yeah, you're right. It's not in the Word. Don't try looking for it. You'll, look at, you'll be embarrassed. Question. That last one, deism, is that what agnostic? Agnostic? It's very similar to agnostics. It's just that deism kind of like acknowledged the fact that God did exist or does exist, but there's an area of detachment. An agnostic is a little bit more of self-knowledge. It's all about what I know. It's the fig leaf. It's the getting dressed with the fig versus being dressed by God. Your own understanding. Um, within the Trinity of God, there are different types of, of studies that I want to I want to uh, get into. But I really believe that right now, because this is a little bit more profound, I'm going to save this one for next week. Amen. I'm going to talk about the Trinity. I'm going to talk about all the different types of beliefs regarding the Trinity and how it was taken out of context. You see what I just showed you a little while ago? Where one could be three, and in some cases even more than that, right? Because you're also a brother. I didn't mention that. You know? What else are you? You're a, you're a nephew. You're a, you're a friend. You're a manager. You're a whole lot of things. And when you go to work, you don't do what you do at the house. At least I hope you don't. Right? Everything is separated and compartmentalized. And those fragments of who you are are the areas that we target. We focus on those fragments. Right now, you may be working. There are people who cannot learn unless they're in this arena. Like one-on-one, -on -one, if I'm teaching them this, they're spaced out. They can't do it. But when they're in this arena, they can listen. There are people who have the ability to get into the fragment of a student when they're listening online. There are people that are so Martha-ish that they can't listen to a thing unless they stop. And when you become so Martha-ish, you, you tend to think, Martha, the Martha syndrome is very dangerous because you start thinking you know it all because you are doing more work than listening at the feet of Jesus. Now, should we all have a little bit of Martha in us? You better believe it. You gotta have some type of work ethic. But when Martha takes over, then you don't learn anything. Right now, there's some of you that I've been teaching for years. For years. I found out today, uh, how many years was it that we saw? Seven years, my Lord. Seven years. But the question is, in those seven years, 
what has been contained and retained and could be then given and regurgitated. Some have retained but they have not learned how to give. Some give thinking that they've retained. Ooh, did you catch that one? The, the, the truth is that it's not about the time you've been, it's what's been revealed to you in that time frame. Then to believe that what I have, I can give, and a lot of it has to do with whether you're moving Martha-ish or Mary-ish. I'm not going to get into the whole Martha Mary thing. Well, that would be another class. But that right there lets us know some of us are very much Martha. We stay in the kitchen. And the only invisible thing we want people to know about is the, smell of, the, the smelling of cooking food, which is invisible, but you can smell. Wow. Mary also wants to deal with an invisible odor, but hers is perfume. One's going to be more powerful than the other. One's more permanent than the other. Martha wants people to come to the house because it smells because the food is good. Mary wants people to come to the house because the, the, the smell of the perfume is good. They both deal with an invisible odor. Just that one is focused on work and the other one is focused on Worship. Please stand. Hebrews chapter one kind of gives us a little bit of a, a breakdown. It's awesome because I think that the more we dive into the three functions or the three persons in one, right, the more we run into a truth that can only be understood through revelation. Hebrews chapter 1, which I'm not going to read today, I'll read it next week, gives us a clear example of, of God's the way he deals with us. He deals with us by way of his paternal. He deals with us by way of the son in authority. And he deals with us by way of the Holy Spirit. And depending on where you are in your life, you'll cater to one side of God more than the other side. Like a lot of people, they focus more on the Godship of God, the Father, you know. God, God this, God that. And they can't see beyond God, the Father. And there are those that, that you know, they're Jesus only. Everything's Jesus, right? But when you fully get the concept of the Trinity, the triune God, then Him being one is not a problem for you. Like, he's not going to get jealous because you're praying, you're saying Jesus more than the Holy Spirit. Nah, man, you got to say Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit's not going to get mad at you because it's still him. But what I'm trying to get you, to, the place I'm trying to get you to be is to get to a place of revelation, the revealed God, the revealed Christ, the revealed Spirit of the living God. Once you do that, Nobody can shake you. You don't leave, you don't, you don't just get up and leave church. I can teach you this all night. But if it's not revealed to you, you'll keep thinking linearly. And linear is not the way to understand this. God is multidimensional. God's voice comes in many ways and forms. He's, he's, he doesn't just speak one way. And him saying to himself that he is the son. I mean, next week is going to be fun. You're going to see him talking to himself. And, and there's a way that he talks to himself. The whole book of Psalms is, is God speaking to himself. It's, it's him.
him talking to himself. He's, he's attracted to himself. <laughs> and and when, you, when you become more like him, then he gives you more of him. Because you are like him. You're letting him take full control of you. And then, and then you get to a place where, where all of a sudden every, everything that's around you makes sense. Your mistakes are not mistakes because it is God's glory in that process. His fixing it up puts things in perspective. And, and now, now the sad moments are not really sad moments. They're moments of God showing off. Can you say this with me? Let his will be done. All right, now you're going to be personal saying, let your will be done in my life, on earth, as it is in heaven. That's what Jesus is trying to show the disciples. Let me navigate you. And in the navigation, you're going to go through deserts. I want you to drive there because I want you to use the vehicle. On all, it's all terrain. That's good. That's good. That's good. I want you to try it out in every area. Oh, but I don't want the mountain. Oh, the mountain. No, not the mountain. Do you understand? Once you go on top of the mountain, your story changes as you come down. You can put the car on cruise control. You can put it on neutral. And it just moves by itself. It's going up the mountain. Oh, man, I got to go. Yes. You have valleys and you have mountains. But here's the good news about God. He will equip you wherever you are. You'll go through it, but you ain't going to be drowning like everybody else. You got scuba diving gear. You breathing underwater. You know why? Because he told you to go there. If you're on assignment, you can't die. You're on assignment. God is not going to mess up your assignment. Because you're on his assignment. So he's going to give you everything you require and need on your assignment. Wherever you go, whoever's around you, those people who talk bad about you may be part of your assignment and they can't affect you because the assignment protects you. Wow. I tell all of you at home, God wants to give you everything your heart desires when it's connected to his desire. And God's assignment in your life, it starts with what you believe or who you believe you are in him and who he is in you. I want you to know that today God has thought about you more than you thought about him. How about his, his thought of you is prehistoric. Oh, I like that word. There are prehistoric thoughts of you. Wow, wow, wow. My God. Isn't that awesome? Yeah, that he thinks of you in the no time zone. Wow. That means he's always thinking about you. No time zone. He, th he thinks of you. Amen. He thinks of you in the no time zone. You standing there was already something that he already knew. Even when you moved your hand off. He saw that too. <laughs> because God, when you surrender to him, your life is successful. Even when the world may say you're unsuccessful. Yeah. It's not about their determination of success. It's about what he says success is. And if you allow that, that to permeate in you, there's no such thing as failure. To fail means that God is not really in the mix. 
And God is not a failing God. Amen. When you say, Lord, I dedicate myself entirely to you. I make mistakes, but I learn from them. How can you go wrong? So here's my prayer for everyone in this place. Please stand. Everyone in this place. I want you to be a tree right now. I want you to be a tree. My prayer is that everyone in this place would be a tree planted. When the wind comes from other places to try to blow you out of here, you lose your leaves, but you stay standing. Yeah. Hey. The saddest thing is when you decide to move on your own. You Listen, don't tell me you leave a place and say God told you when you were upset the week before or two weeks before, three weeks before. It doesn't work that way. You don't leave upset. Right. Right. You don't say God told me to go to another place when you're going to that place is predicated on a feeling that you have that's negative. That's good. God doesn't use a negative wind. He doesn't have to. He, he'll, he'll, listen, the only way a negative wind will, will navigate you is if you're still in the path of God. I know you didn't catch that one. A negative wind can navigate you because you know how to move and shift your sail. And the sail with the negative wind will still take you to your destiny. And ask all the ministers to come to the front, please. Ministers. Y'all gonna minister today. I'm gonna watch y'all minister today. Praise God. Praise the Lord. Today's connection is real simple. I desire those roots to go deep. So that we see increase in the house of the Lord or the congregation of houses. See increase. See increase. Come here for a minute, both of you. Yeah, I, I gotta get you real fast. Come here. I'm gonna get some. I know, I'm sorry. I had to stop you. Ain't no way you'll miss on this one. I'm gonna catch you. I know. Father and daughter, I love it when you guys come together. Amen. Y'all make declarations every single time. There's no way. There's no way. I haven't seen you in a thousand years. That's not true. <laughs> Hold hands. Your turn. That's, that's your seed. Ooh, she, she lived in here. That's why when you receive, she receives, and, and vice versa. Yo, yo. God has caused to be a strong connection between both of you. That's why she's the one who keeps coming to church, and she keeps looking for God more and more. So here's what, this is a, an example of what's going to happen, guys. So people are going to come to the front. Those of you who are going to come to the front, you're going to receive this. It is for your roots to go deep into the ground. That's good. So you're unmovable. It's real simple. It's not going to take much. It's just going to be a touch from God. And that touch is going to be sufficient for those roots to run deep. Deep, deep, deep. Deep. So when that wind blows, when that wind blows, your roots are deep. And you're still standing. No leaves, are just standing there. Still giving a sign of worship. So if that's you, I just want you to come to the front. We just want to come in agreement, stay firm, stay solid. Now y'all can leave when, when the time comes, when y'all can get up. Because there was no way I was going to let y'all leave without receiving that. Thank you, Lord. I want you to be rooted. Rooted, 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 rooted. Wow. Thank you, Jesus. Rooted, rooted, deeply rooted, 
deeply rooted, deeply rooted, deeply rooted, deeply profound, so rooted that your roots know where the flow is, under, un, underground flow. Deeply rooted, deeply, deeply rooted, deeply rooted, deeply rooted, deeply rooted. Jesus. Deeply rooted, deeply rooted, rooted. rooted. That, that, that wasn't for you, by the way. That's for them. That's for somebody. My God. My God. That's for somebody. That's for somebody. Jesus. That's for somebody. That's for somebody. Come, come to the front, ready to receive your package. You're not going to be easily moved. You're not going to be easily moved. Uh, nobody's going to be able to tell you a story and, and cause you to feel that you have to move. You're not going to be easily moved. Yeah. You're going to be firm. Your firmness is going to be based on how deep your roots go. Take, take a moment to get outside of yourself and say, you know, I want to be deeply rooted. It's just, you know, this is when trees can walk. This is when a tree can walk. Just, just come in and get yourself connected and come in agreement. Because that's, that's what we do. We, we come in agreement. And, and when we come in agreement, it's the deeply rooted part. We come in agreement and the, and the roots run deep. Deep, deep. Deep, so deep. So deep. Mm, Jesus. Jesus, 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 Jesus. Deep. Deeply rooted. Oh, for those at home, I pray you're planted where you are. And may God's flow, his river, continue to keep you in all seasons of your life. Receiving from the flow from the throne room of God. That river that never stops. We love you and we thank you. We bless you for joining us tonight. God bless. Thank you.